Aloha, ahe, ahe, kako, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Kanaka Express. I'm very excited tonight with the information that we have and the guests that we have coming on tonight. And I'm really happy that for those of you who are tuning in uh, are able to do so because the information that we're going to be providing is very, very, very important. And especially in all the years that we've, we've had, and trying to find a way to get through the federal government for them to uh, recognize that the Hawaiian Kingdom is a sovereign independent country. And so tonight, I guess our uh, Dr. Keanu Sai, who is a regent for the Council of Regency and uh, recognized uh, agent from the Permanent Court of Ar Arbitration as the Hawaiian Kingdom agent and Along with him tonight, we're going to have Dexter Kayama, uh, who is the Hawaiian Kingdom Attorney General. And Dexter is a, a long practicing attorney and he has taken on another hat of being the Attorney General for the Hawaiian Kingdom. Joining me tonight again is my awesome key host from Kamehameha Schools. And I'm really, really excited about having. Uh, uh, Kumu Kelly Akina. Hello, my kako, naho makamaka. Welcome back to Kanaka Express. I uh, have a good show, a uh, good show for you guys tonight. Um, lots of questions, hopefully more answers. So stay tuned. Here we go. Yeah, I, I, I'm very excited about it because uh, in the topic that we're going to be talking about is uh, a complaint that was filed in U.S. federal court against, uh, it was a Hawaiian Kingdom versus uh, Joe Biden, President of the United States and everybody else all the way down, as well as the uh, all the consulates that exist in the Hawaiian Kingdom today. And so we're going to be talking about that, the impact and the 800 pound gorilla, you know, referenced by uh, in the blog post that Dr. Kanosai put up. And I'd like to introduce this 800 pound gorilla, the article that came out, you know, and, and the, the case was submitted 11 months ago, you know, in May of 2021. And it was a complaint. I went to be Biden and then uh, the filing with the amended complaint on August 11, 2021. And in this, uh, we're in this article that is on the blog, hawaiikingdom.org slash blog, uh, says there was always the 800 pound gorilla in the room that the court did not want to directly address until last week. So we're going to be talking about that 800 pound gorilla and the case itself. And Anything else that you'd like to add, Kili? Yeah, I think it is important to understand about this um, article. There are many um, different organizations out there um, who are fighting for our independence and fighting for recognition of, of our occupation. And so it's, it's kind of interesting because this article, again, goes to some of the, the federal court proceedings, but it just brings to light um, the manao that, you know, how much evidence that we have as Kanaka as we have as Hawaiian nationals, people who love Hawaii, how much evidence is out there that we are indeed occupied. And we, it shows through this court case that um, the evidence is on our side. Now, it doesn't matter what faction or what group or what Lahui membership you are. Um, this is important for all of us. You know, it's something that we can get behind as a, as a Lahui, as a community, you know, to really understand the facts behind the case. Um, because a lot of, there's a lot of things in, in this 
court case that are legal matters. And it's much more than just a political movement, but it's an actual legal matter. Um, and so just learning to understand a little bit more about that can bring us together. And um, again, the way forward is for us to unify the same way that our Kupuna did in 1897 with the Kuwait petitions. But we got to get on the same page, Kanakas. We got to get on the same, the same um, pathway so that we can actually move forward together. So yeah, it's super exciting to learn a little bit more about yeah. this. So mahalo. Yeah, that, that's a good point that you bring up, Kelly, because... You know, there is so many factions out there. And with the factions being out there, they're saying the wrong things at the wrong times. And But yet, they're the ones that are getting the I, all the news, news media to show up, da 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 And people are rallying around the wrong people at, for the wrong reasons. And so hopefully, uh, tonight, uh, this will be huge clarity, you know, for everyone to see that they need to get on this wagon. They need to get on this wagon. So what I'd like to do now is uh, bring on the Hawaiian Kingdom Attorney General, Dexter Kayama, and uh, we're going to be talking about about this case and, and uh, some of the procedural things that took place. And I'd like to welcome uh, Dexter K.L. Moku Kayama, our Hawaiian Kingdom Attorney General. Welcome. Aloha. Oh my God, cool. thank you for having me on. Um, and I know we also have the privilege and honor of having Dr. Sai on as well later this evening. So, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Uh, can you can you explain what uh, I guess some of the important parts of this case that you believe people need to know about? Okay. Okay, good. So what I'll do is I'll try to give you the procedural history of the case. Sure. And, and I'll start with the amended complaint. Um, those of you may know that we initially filed a, a complaint and later amended it, but I'll start there. So um, we filed an amended complaint, uh, Hawaiian Kingdom did, uh, against President Biden and a host of defendants. So it was filed on August 11th of 2021. Um and the uh, defendants, Hawaiian Kingdom, of course, was the plaintiff in the complaint. The defendants included President Joseph Biden, um, Vice President Kamala Harris, um, the um, commander of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, as well as the um, uh, Charles Reddick of the Internal Revenue Service. Also included in the complaint were a, a number of consular defendants, all of them having uh, consulates or having honorary consulates here in Hawaii, illegally, of course, because they are operating under U.S. law and not Hawaiian Kingdom law. And then uh, we followed up with uh, state defendants, state of Hawaii, Governor Ige, um, and agencies of the state. I'm sorry, I can't think of them, not right now, but they include the Department of uh, Securities um, and, um, shoot, I'm sorry, I can't remember the names right now. But what was important about the amended complaint is that one, at the very onset, uh, we were asking the court that the court had to consider uh, transform transforming itself from an Article Three court, which is a U.S. Uh, administered court, into an Article Two court before it could uh, before it could um, um, address any of the claims of the Hawaiian Kingdom or any claims of relief of any other party. Um, now, I'll have Dr. Sai explain a little more what an Article II court, but essentially an Article II court is one that operates under the laws of occupation. And as we all know, and as we've discussed before, Hawaii at the present time and the Hawaiian Kingdom is under an illegal, prolonged illegal occup occupation by the United States since January of 19, 1893. Um, and as such, the international humanitarian law dictates that... Um, that the occupying power, that being the United States, administer Hawaiian Kingdom law with the laws of the occupied state. Um, unless, and as Dr. Sai will explain, unless it's by military necessity. Um, that includes the judicial system and the operation and the maintaining, main, maintaining of the judicial laws under the Hawaiian Kingdom. Um, in the amended complaint, we also made sure that we notified all the parties as to the existence of the Hawaiian Kingdom and why it continues to exist and why the laws of occupation uh, apply in this proceeding. Um, we had the great benefit of prior to filing the amended complaint 
that the um, International Association of Democratic Lawyers, the National Lawyers Guild, and the Water Protective Legal, Legal Collective filed a motion for leave to amend to file an amicus brief. Now, the reason I said before the amended complaint is because that motion for leave was um, initially denied by the court without prejudice. And the reason it was denied without prejudice is prior to the filing of the amended complaint, a defendant, Kauai County, as, whether, as well as Hawaii County and Maui County, filed motions to dismiss. We filed a memorandum in opposition to those motions to dismiss. Um, and then the IADL, the National Lawyers Guild, and the Water Legal Protective filed their motion for leave to file attached to that motion to dismiss in the mem memorandum in opposition. It's Kauai County, Hawaii County. Because we did so, the court decided or determined that the motion for leave, since it was attached to the, motion, to the opposition to the motion to dismiss, was now moot. We thereafter filed this motion, uh, this amended complaint, and then the IADL, the National Lawyers Guild, Water Legal Protective Collective, then filed an amended motion for leave to file amicus brief. And that amended motion now was tied to the amended complaint directly. Because it was tied to the amended complaint, shortly thereafter, the court did grant the motion for leave to file, and the amicus brief was filed in these proceedings. Now, what's important of, because what's important of this is that um, the International Association of Democratic Lawyers uh, has a, a consultative status with the um, with the United Nations and the National Lawyers Guild. They are uh, well respected and, and well known uh, legal organizations, especially in the areas of international law. Uh, and what they did is that they confirmed what we've been arguing and what we've been representing to parties, including in this case all along, is that the Hawaiian Kingdom, of course, continued to exist um, as a sovereign state. And that this court, that being the United States District Court for the District of Hawaii, was under an obligation under the laws of occupation to transform itself into an Article II court and no longer um, consider the claims brought in this case under an Article III or a U.S. Um, US administrative court. Let me see. I start to get lost in all the details, but let me get, I know we we're talking about the 800 pound gorilla in this case. And so let me go forward and go back. So the 800 pound gorilla really is addressed in the Hawaiian Kingdom's motion to alter or amend the court's denial. Um, one, the court's granting of a defendant, Norvell, and he's the honorary consulate to Sweden, his motion to dismiss the amended complaint against him specifically, as well as the court's denial of the Hawaiian Kingdom's motion for judicial notice. So the 800 pound gorilla is our motion to alter or amend the court's order there, because we believe that the court's order was, was um, in error. And we point out those errors uh, by our motion to alter or amend. Before we get there, we just have to let you know that after filing our amended complaint and grant our claims for relief, Norvell, an honorary consulate of Sweden, did file its motion to dismiss. Shortly thereafter, the United States filed its statement of interest. And in its statement of interest, the United States basically claimed that all of the consular defendants we had named had, uh, had sovereign immunity under U.S. law and U.S. treaties. Okay, so they were invoking U.S. law and U.S. treaties to provide immunity, sovereign immunity against these consular defendants. United States also filed a mission, a motion to dismiss its amended, the amended complaint against all parties and especially the U.S. defendants. So, of course, we responded and we filed our memorandum in opposition to both Norvell's motion and our memorandum in opposition to the U.S. motion to dismiss. We also filed um, a motion, um, a request for judicial notice initially. And Dr. Sai will explain more um, in detail the motion for the request for judicial notice. And it was the juridical act of the recognition by the PCA, including the administrative council to the PCA, which includes all these consular defendants in the United States, their acknowledgement of the Hawaiian um, 
Hawaiian kingdom as a party to the arbitral proceedings. Um, thereafter, there were replies uh, and, and oppositions filed by, by the United States and then the court's order, which I spoke about. In the court's order, granting Norvell's motion to dismiss, and that's the Swedish consulate, essentially the court, let me take a look at that real quickly, sorry. The court basically um, <laughs> they used the U.S. Law, like, law again and said that we provided no, no facts or evidence to conclude that the state of Hawaii, excuse me, that the Hawaiian kingdom continued to exist. Now, as Dr. Sai will explain, they left out a big part of that or an important part of the case law that the court relied on in granting Norvell's motion. Um, and that, of course, is presently, that there's presently no facts or evidence to conclude that the Hawaiian King kingdom continues to exist. And Dr. Sai will explain more why the court is in error on that. But the court also um, denied, it, a grant, denied the motion in part and said that the Hawaiian kingdom could thereafter amend its motion or amend its complaint against Norvell, as well as amend its, um, if it wish to amend its complaint against all other parties. If, they, if we were to file, if we wanted to amend our complaint against all our other parties, we would have to first file a motion for leave. Now, as Dr. Sai will explain, uh, essentially the court was setting a trap for the Hawaiian King. By filing a motion to amend or a motion for leave, um, what that did was the court was trying to trap the Hawaiian Kingdom into acknowledging the court's authority under U.S. law. Um, instead, oh, secondly, in the order denying the Hawaiian Kingdom's request for judicial notice, later converted by the court into a motion for judicial notice, the court again basically relied on those cases that said the Hawaiian Kingdom, we, that there's been no uh, evidence to prove that Hawaiian Kingdom continues to exist with the attributes of a state sovereign nature. And then we get to this 800 pound gorilla, which is our motion to alter our men. Um, I think that kind of brings us up to speed on the procedural aspects of it. Okay. And I can comment more, but perhaps we can have Dr. Sai come yeah. in and explain um, essentially the article I, resulted in the 800 pound gorilla. <laughs> I, I think this would be a good time to, uh, to bring Dr. Sai in. But uh, Kelly, you have any questions before? No? <laughs> or I you I, know I what? I a flow chart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Well, I'd like to introduce our second guest, uh, Council of Regency uh, agent for the Hawaiian Kingdom, Dr. Keanu Sai. Dr. Sai, welcome. Welcome. Well, uh, okay, you're on mute, so you need to unmute your. Hello, everyone. Yeah, hello. Hello. So, so I'm not the regent. Uh, I'm on the council of regency, but I'm the minister of the interior, and Dexter is also on the regency as the attorney general. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, that corrected. All right. So uh, you heard uh, Dexter explain, you know, some of the things. So uh, what, what would you have to add to that and and fill in all the empty spaces? Well, two things I wanted to address that Dexter brought up, okay? Uh, first is the 800 pound gorilla, which is the Hawaiian kingdom as a country. And the second would be the Article Two Court, right? And what is an Article Two Court? And then from there, I think we can have some dialogue on, on what actually took place, which is what Dexter was referring to. Uh, he had you had some points in there that uh, would warrant more attention uh, and discussion. Okay. Okay. So, so we're talking about the hundred, the eight hundred pound gorilla. Okay. So, the Hawaiian Kingdom as a country existed in the nineteenth century as an independent state. That's why it was an eight hundred pound gorilla, right? And the Hawaiian Kingdom had a government. Now, that government is not the gorilla. 
the government is, you might say, the mouthpiece of the guerrilla so the guerrilla can speak the country. So a government is made up of the people of the country, and it's called a government. And that government or that mouthpiece speaks on behalf of the state, which is the Hawaiian kingdom. Why that is really important here, because without knowing that and without discerning the government from the Hawaiian kingdom as a country, we wouldn't be here right now talking about this federal lawsuit. Okay, because if what occurred in 1893 on January 17th was the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom government, if we think it was an overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom, then we assume that the country and the government was overthrown, right? But that is the mistake. And that's why education on what is international law has played a crucial role in discerning between the government and the state. Okay, so the Hawaiian kingdom, the government was overthrown. No doubt, and it was unlawful, admitted to by President Cleveland. Okay, that's clear. That's not even disputable. But that did not overthrow the country. You can't overthrow a country. You can only acquire a country. Okay, And by acquiring a country would consequently extinguish that gorilla under international law. Now, the only way that the United States could acquire the Hawaiian Kingdom after it overthrew the government they needed a treaty. There's no treaty. So we know that. So if there's no treaty, then the Hawaiian kingdom still exists as a country despite its government being overthrown and not around. Or should I say, not in effective control because Queen Deliko Kalani was around until her death in 1917, right? Now, that gorilla, you might say, when the queen passed away in 1917, it fell asleep. It fell asleep in this house called the Hawaiian Islands, in the corner, right? And the United States came here and they didn't get a treaty. They just came to Hawaii by passing a law in 1898 during the Spanish-American War saying, we got you. So Uncle Sam, on behalf of the United States, came to Hawaii and said, the gorilla is dead. He's now the new owner for these islands. Right. Well, that gorilla was just sleeping. <laughs> it wasn't dead, okay, because it had no mouthpiece. Okay. And then when America was here through Uncle Sam, it began to brainwash the children in the schools starting off in the early 1900s. And they began to teach the population of children that the gorilla is dead and that Uncle Sam is here and this is the United States. And since then, this false information has been institutionalized where within three generations people thought the gorilla was dead and now they're just talking to uncle sam right now in 1997 understanding how international law works dealing with the same principles of establishing governments in exile during occupations steps were taken to form a regency, a regency under Hawaiian law, similar in effect to how the Belgians established a regency in London when Belgium was invaded by the Nazis and King Leopold was captured. So these Belgian nationals formed Council of Regency under Belgian law in exile to serve in the absence of the monarch. So they could speak on behalf of that 800 pound gorilla called Belgium. Okay. Now, once the Council of Regency was established, or the Regency was established, eventually becoming a Council of Regency, the gorilla woke up. It started to talk. And at first, people were shocked. Right? How can this gorilla be talking? It's been dead. <laughs> no, it's talking. And from 1997, that gorilla began to walk in the islands. And then it also went to the Permanent Court of Arbitration. That gorilla went to the Permanent Court of Arbitration in Lance Larson versus the Hawaiian Kingdom. And the Permanent Court of Arbitration acknowledged the Hawaiian gorilla. And that's what allowed the case to go through, right? Now, the Council of Regency knew that even though the gorilla was walking around, there was so much confusion because you have what has been called the sovereignty movement where everybody has their 
say on what they think the Hawaiian kingdom or their country should be. Now, the big difference here, we're not talking about a new gorilla. The Council of Regency is representing an old gorilla, a gorilla from the 19th century, not a new gorilla that needs international recognition as a country. This is operating purely as a successor to Queen Lilipo Kalani, representing that gorilla, no different, no different than how uh, uh, Queen Lilipo Kalani was a successor to King Kalakaua. Queen Lili Ukalani did not need international recognition that she was a queen. As long as it was under Hawaiian law and not operating as a revolution, she didn't need recognition. So just as Kalakaua replaced King Lunalilo, he did not need recognition at the international level because there is a rule in international law that as long as you operate within the rules and laws of that country, for successorship of government, you don't need diplomatic recognition. Now, if you're gonna to try to create your own gorilla, a new gorilla, you need diplomatic recognition. And that's called de facto recognition. So we knew that back then when we were doing this. So when we think about the sovereignty movement, they have nothing to do with the 800 pound gorilla. What they're trying to do is create their own gorillas. But this is a legal process because when we, form the Council of Regency to represent the gorilla, we also put ourselves in a position of, how would you say, vicarious liability. <laughs> because if we're using Hawaiian law and we use it wrong, guess what happens to us? We can be held accountable by people who don't even know what the law is yet. So it was very important that our approach in, in representing this gorilla as a council of regency was within the framework and authority of Hawaiian law, right? And, and these, and this authority will be tested. So as we, as we move forward to where we are now in the federal lawsuit, we're talking about a government representing a country in a federal lawsuit against another government representing another country. And that's where that's at, right? So when Dexter, as the attorney general was speaking about the, the procedures on, on the filing of the complaint and then filing of the amended complaint, these are legal procedures that have to be very precise. And that's why Dexter, as the attorney, this is his job, right? My job, when I work with Dexter, is to bring in the legal context, the, the framing of it, uh, but Dexter works out the procedural aspects on how this is played out. And I have to say that for this case to have gone on for 11 months speaks to the veracity of the pleadings themselves and also those that are involved, like the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, the National Lawyers Guild, uh, the Water Protectors Legal Collective. These people would not step into a federal lawsuit if it was frivolous, and that's what's important, right? But there is, as what we call in the Army when I was in it, attention to detail. <laughs> I mean, it's so important to stay focused on exactly what are we trying to accomplish in this federal lawsuit. And I think this is a good opportunity for that to be shared for the people who are listening, <clears throat> other than just reading the pleadings, which are very legalese, but also the blog articles that tries to break it down and make it user-friendly. Uh, before I get into the Article 2 court, um, is there anything that you folks had as maybe seeking to clarify, uh, Kili or, or Kali? Um, I think just listening, you kind of explained it pretty good as far as like um, talking about like I guess the like what authority are you suing the other government or you know what I mean by which and I think that's something that's important too is understanding that like you said there are many groups creating that trying to create that new country or the new constitution but your the council regency is representing the original country 
right? right? The original gorilla. So I thought that was important for people to understand. And because um, I know for myself too, as a teacher working with young people, it's trying to figure out, I'm not trying to give them an answer, but I want them to be able to look at both sides and figure out, okay, what's legal and what's just my personal opinion. Where I see a lot of people out there have this personal opinion part, but they're not necessarily looking at the legalities of it, of how, why is the Council of Regency, why was it recognized, um, why is it, or does it have authority, you know, to actually be in this case that you said that lasted for 11 months, lasting for 11 months. So I just think that that's a, a very clear, uh, important part that everyone needs to understand is um, the steps that took place in order for the council to be recognized to be at this point. So yeah, mahalo. Yeah, you know, I, I might also add um, that, that one of the benefits or one of the, uh, I guess, accompli accomplishments of the filing of this complaint was uh, to get the uh, International Association of Democratic Lawyers, the National Lawyers Guild and the Water Le Legal Protective a collective to file the amicus brief. And basically what the amicus brief is telling us in the, the language of uh, this vernacular is that the 800 pound gorilla is alive and, and thumping, it, thumping its chest, you know? So yeah. it's no longer sleeping, it's here. And, and, and telling everyone, so they provide additional legal support for the position we've always asserted. And again, you know, their, their background and their, um, their reputation is, you know, world renowned, right? So they add that kind of, that kind of support to the complaint that we've stated. So, so, so with the reputation of uh, both of you and the all these international legal organizations coming in, what has, what impact has that had on the judges? Oh, uh, in this case, yes. I, well, if I can, I mean, Dexter may want to chime in as well, but it had, it has an effect on the judges because the judges accepted or granted approval, which is what leave means, permission, to file the amicus. Because if the amicus was frivolous, right, and just gibberish or nonsensical legal arguments, they had that ability to deny filing of the amicus. So, so the discretion was with in this case, the magistrate judge, Ron Trader, to, in the fact that he did grant permission for them to file the amicus, because he needed a copy first. So when Dexter made the reference that they filed a motion to file an amicus, you have to provide that amicus brief for the judge mm -hmm. to review. And then for the judge a month later to grant permission for the formal filing. I think it speaks volumes to the competency of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, National Lawyers Guild, and the Water Protectors Legal Collective as to their legal acumen and, 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 and how legally astute they are in presenting the arguments. And mind you, we had nothing to do with the drafting of that amicus on what is an Article 2 court because people who submit amicus or, or entities that submit amicus Amicus comes from the Latin word, uh, well, amicus is Latin for the word amicable, right? Friend, to be a friend. So when you, when these people want to submit information to a court, they're submitting it as a friend of the court, not the friend of the parties, a friend of the judge or judges to help them in making a decision that is a part of the proceedings. And in this case, it was the status of the court being in order to court. Anything you wanted to add, Dex? Yeah, yeah and um, um, that is entirely correct, Keanu. And I think in addressing uh, Kali's uh, question, um, I think what we've been doing, going through is we've been playing, well, not so much playing, but we've been engaged in this um, this chess or Konani match so far with the court because the court continues to want to uh, address it from a, from a perspective that we know is wrong, uh, clearly wrong and in error. And it's been our obligation and our duties uh, to try to correct the court and to try to, what's the best word, uh, to Before. legally steer the court in, in the direction that it should be steered in order to make the decision it should be making. Um, and that's where um, the motion to alter or amend comes in. Um, also, I might just say that um, while the complaint itself focuses on specific claims for relief, 
and specific things we want the court to do, of course, transform itself into an Article II court first, and then issue um, the claims for le relief that we're asking for, which is to acknowledge that the Hawaiian Kingdom continues to exist, to also acknowledge that the Supremacy Clause uh, prevents um, the United States from operating and administering its laws here um, in the occupied territory, in the territory of Hawaii, and also, among other things, requiring that these consulars or these consulates require authority not from the U.S., but from the Hawaiian Kingdom to operate here in Hawaiian territory. So those are specific items that we talk about that we want addressed in the complaint. But also, I think Keanu can speak to it more. The complaint also has um, ramifications or consequences outside of the legal proceedings itself. And some of that has come to fruition. Well, for example, with the Czech Republic's closure uh, of its um, of its embassy or its consulate here in Hawaii, I think that is a byproduct not only of the complaint itself, but um, maybe addressing the, the issues that go beyond the complaint. Yeah, no. You know, so I just want to clarify um, what we're asking the court to do, right? So in acknowledging the Hawaiian kingdom exists, is one thing, but to have the court say the Hawaiian kingdom exists is another thing, right? So what's important here is the 800-pound gorilla exists. That's why we filed the lawsuit. And the acknowledgement of that continued existence of that gorilla was very explicit by the United States and these 30 countries that have consulates here at the Permanent Court of Arbitration. So they were there from 1999 to 2001. They knew that the Hawaiian Kingdom continued to exist when the Permanent Court of Arbitration acknowledged the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state, right? And in a dispute with its government. So that is a given. So we're not asking the court to re-recognize or re-acknowledge the, con the continued existence of the Hawaiian Kingdom. What we're asking the court to do in light of what the United States had already done in contemporary times, not 1800s, but 1999 to 2001, we want the court to transform itself into an Article II court. By transforming itself into an Article II court, it is by that very act acknowledging the Hawaiian kingdom still exists. Okay, so that's different than saying we need the court to declare the Hawaiian kingdom exists. No, we're not asked there. The, the declaratory relief that is being sought in the amended complaint is not asking the court to declare the Hawaiian kingdom exists. It's to declare that the state of Hawaii has to transform itself into uh, an occupying power to administer the laws of the occupied state, right? So, and that's important. Now, uh, Kili, I want to tied back into what we were discussing earlier because that very issue of what these sovereignty groups are doing as opposed to what we're doing as a government of a country that has existed as an independent state since 1843 is actually coming into play in these proceedings, right? And that is what we call the political question doctrine, right? So the political question doctrine and the United States actually made that argument that this is a political question and therefore this court should dismiss this case, right? But there's been some confusion as to what exactly is a political question, right? What is it? Is it politics, right? People may assume well, it's, it's politics as far as answering the question. Let, let me clear up what it actually is. So the United States government is separated into three branches of government. So Article 1, is Congress, Article 2 is the President, Article 3 is the Judiciary, right? So that's why the federal court here is claiming authority as an Article 3 court, meaning the Article 3 of the United States Constitution that defines the Judiciary, right? But an Article 2 court comes under the President, okay? President as Commander-in-Chief of U.S. troops who are de deployed abroad. So when, when the United States military is abroad, in a foreign country, neither Congress nor the Supreme Court has anything to do with that. They are led by the president as the commander in chief who must faithfully execute the law. Domestically, it's called domestic law. Internationally, it's called international law, right? 
So when we look at that Article 2, meaning the president, the president is also the sole representative of the United States in foreign relations. So if you are a new country, right, that needs diplomatic recognition to exist or acknowledge that it exists, like Palestine, right, you need international recognition. Now, the United States at present has not recognized Palestine as an independent state. They're holding out along with a bunch of other uh, countries, right? Now, by the United States not recognizing Palestine, and let's say a lawsuit is filed in federal court basing the case on Palestine as a country, a defendant would raise that point saying this is a political question because the question of Palestinian sovereignty as a country should not be determined by the court. This should be determined by the political branches of government and that would be the president. So political question does not refer to politics but rather the political branch. So until the United States explicitly recognizes Palestine as an independent state, until they do, it's a political question, and you can't get anywhere in a federal court. So judges cannot step into the shoes of the executive branch to determine whether or not a country exists or doesn't exist. That's, that's the function of the president's authority, of the executive branch. So whenever sovereignty groups try to make arguments in state and federal, well, maybe in federal courts. I'm going to talk only federal courts. In the federal court, the political question doctrine always comes up. Oh, it is a political question because the United States has not recognized Wayne Kingdom. What they're referring to, the United States has not recognized their perception of their entity that they are claiming is a country, whether it's a republic, whether it's a monarchy, whatever the case may be. Because they're trying to say that we're a new gorilla, but you don't have recognition. Now, in our particular situation, the Hawaiian Kingdom is an old country. The United States already recognized it. The United States had an embassy in Honolulu. The Hawaiian Kingdom had an embassy in Washington, D.C. That treaty of 1849 explicitly recognized under Article 12 that when Americans are in the Hawaiian Kingdom, they are subject to Hawaiian Kingdom law. And when Hawaiian subjects are in America, they are subject to American law. So that is an explicit recognition of the two statutes of the two countries, right? So when we restored the government as a successor to Queen Lili Okalani, under and by virtue of Hawaiian kingdom law, constitutional provisions, we're not a new government representing a new country we're just the successor government representing an old country. So the political question would not apply, right? Because we showed proof and evidence that the United States already recognized the Hawaiian Kingdom. And that's why we're here. And that the United States acknowledged the Council of Regency and the Hawaiian Kingdom at the Permanent Court of Arbitration. So, so, so that's why this case is different. This case so is not about a new entity, but rather bringing to light the old entity that still exists today. Right? So, so, so um, in the explanation that you just gave, why would you have to go through federal court? Um, <clears throat> I guess to get the United States, why wouldn't you just go directly to the U.S. State Department and negotiate country to country. But it's the big gorilla. We're forcing the hand. And that's what the article is about, was nobody wants to address the gorilla, which is 11 months into this case, until the court, the judge made those two orders, which prompted us to respond. So when the Hawaiian Kingdom government entered the federal court, we're looking at enforcement, right? And the court is supposed to be a means of enforcement of rights. That's how it's supposed to work. 
So we're not saying the court should not exist to provide enforcement. We're saying the court needs to transform its existence in order to enforce certain rights because they are situated in our country. It's not situated in their country. So this came as an opportunity to inform the judges. You're in the wrong country, but you can still be a judge under U.S. law, under Article 2. So Article 2 provides for the United States to have federal courts, okay, military courts, through Article 2 of the president in a foreign country. And the amicus brief, which was drafted by the uh, IEDL, the NLG, and the Water Protectors Legal Collective, they, express, they explain that. It's all there. You know, so it's not like this is a new novel idea of being an can, article two. Can that um, the amicus brief be used by other groups, or is that specifically just for this case? Well, the difference is you don't want to. Well, if it's a group, then don't touch it because it's dealing with a government. So the amicus is actually addressing the fact that the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists, and the Council of Regency is its government, but the court has to transform itself. So this is not like people can use the amicus. I mean, they can read it, they can learn from it, but when these three, what they call amici, that's the plural for people who wrote the amicus, when these three entities wrote the amici, they wrote it in support of the Hawaiian Kingdom and the Council of Regency for this case. So all amicus are, 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 are case-oriented on what the court will eventually have to address. So people can't use it in other cases because it was done for us uh, in this particular case because we need the court to transform itself into an Article II court so that we can get an order from the court declaring that the state of Hawaii must transform itself into an occupying power. But before they can get to that point, they have to transform themselves into an Article II court. Oh, so what I mean by, like, say somebody else has another court case and they're claiming the same information they could read that but they couldn't use that in their case saying that here it's the same information well then they would be is. well then they would be impersonating themselves as a government when they're not so how do how do they um I, you kind of mentioned the protection piece so like right now hawaii is occupied and how are the rights of the hawaii nationals being protected um you know what i mean like what you if the court doesn't recognize it's occupied, then they don't recognize that Hawaiian nationals protected people. Is that the same or is that am I a little bit? Okay, so actually the court is recognizing that the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists. And I'm not playing semantics. <laughs> They're actually recognizing the Hawaiii Kingdom still exists and that Hawaii is occupied. And, and the reason why I'm saying that is because as stated in our order, I mean our uh, uh, motion for a uh, amendment or altering of the of the order right dexter and i have been working on this together so i'm very familiar with the the substance of the orders dexter as well knows it but also the procedural side i i, I defer to him on that how how it's done how do we get it through now this centers on and it's all laid out in that in that uh, motion judge kobayashi provided an opportunity for the gorilla, metaphorically, to explain to her why we still exist. Not that we're asking you to recognize us, but you have to provide evidence that we don't exist. Not that you agree with us, right? And it goes to what is called the presumption of state continuity. Okay? So, and that's important. So presumption of state continuity. So there's a difference between the word presume and assume, okay? So presume is to take a position based upon evidence. Assume is to take a position without evidence, right? That's why sometimes you may hear people say, and I say, you know, ask you me, okay? Don't assume because you make an ass out of you and me. No, presume, go find the information. So when you say presumption, that means there's a position taken. So let's take a look at how that presumption works with the presumption of innocence, right? So when somebody is going through a trial, that person is presumed to be innocent 
until proven guilty. The prosecutor cannot yell that the person is guilty without providing any evidence because the person is still innocent. There needs to be evidence to go against that presumption. And, and in the legal writing, uh, that's called rebuttable evidence. You have to rebut the presumption, right? So when you when 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 somebody owns a car, let's break it down into much more simple terms. Okay, so let's say Kili you own a car, right? And the name and the car is in your name, the registration papers, it's all in your name. And somebody steals it, right? And that person says it's my car. Okay, no, there is a presumption that that Kili owns that car because there is evidence that he had that he paid for it and it's and it's in the glove box, uh, glove compartment, right? So until the person who stole the car provides rebuttable evidence that you stole the car to him, therefore he didn't steal it, until he shows evidence, you are presumed to still own the car. You don't have to prove you own the car. They got to prove you don't own the car because you got the registration, right? So that's you take that concept and you look at a country, and it's called the presumption of the continued existence of a state despite its government being overthrown. And that's a principle of international law. So in every situation of when a government is overthrown by another country's military, it is presumed that that country still exists, despite the fact that its government was overthrown. That's the presumption that is expected, that is understood. So after that point, the opposing party claiming that country is extinguished is the entity that's supposed to provide evidence that it was extinguished, not that this party has to prove the country still exists. All you got to show that it did exist, you show it doesn't exist. And the way you show it doesn't exist, which is what is called rebuttable evidence, is a treaty. Show a treaty. No treaty, the Mikino still exists. And it's not asking anybody to recognize it. No, that's it. It's not like... Kelly, you need everybody to recognize that you own the car. No, you got you got the paperwork. You own it, right? Okay, let me let, let me ask a question here. You know, with that, you know, we're we're asking quote the federal court to recognize uh, or or to to change itself to an Article Two court. Okay, so, um, but at the same time, why wouldn't uh, we go to the U.S. State Department? and file whatever it is with the State Department for them to start negotiations with the Council of Regents. They're not going to right. because the guerrilla, we're dealing with this stuff in the court. That's why when you're dealing with a court, you're dealing with legal proceedings that will bind people. So the United States as a defendant includes the State Department. It includes the Department of Justice. They're all named in the complaint. So you don't right. go outside of the complaint and go talk to one of the departments. But isn't the State Department the one that you would be negotiating with country to country? And that, that, would be, that, that, that would be after the fact. Right now we're dealing with the United States, which includes the State Department. They are defendants in this case. So our communication with the United States is through the court, through the pleadings. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So, Kali, if I might also add, um, maybe in, in a way to answer your question, in the complaint or in the amended complaint, not only is our primary uh, objective is to have the, the district court transfer itself to an Article II court, and we provide all the, the legal basis for it, but once it transforms itself into an Article II court, then we are asking for declaratory injunctive relief. The court, as an Article II court, grant us this, this uh, declarative and injunctive relief, and that includes... And I'll just read for it. Declare that all laws of defendant U.S. and state of Hawaii and its counties and the maintenance of defendant USA's military installations are unauthorized and contrary to the 1907 Hague Regulations, 1907 Hague Convention 5, the 1949 Fourth Geneva Convention and Hawaiian Kingdom Law. That's one of the claims we're asking. The other one is declare that the Supremacy Clause prohibits the state of Hawaii from any cur curtailment or interference of the USA's already explicit re recognition of the Council of Regency as the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom, 
and the Council of Regency's authority to represent the Hawaiian ki Kingdom as a state, both domestic and international level. And the Council of Regency is vested with rights and powers of the government of an occupied state possesses pursuant to international humanitarian law. We are also asking that the, the court, as an Article II court, enjoin all the defendants from implementing or enforcing all laws of the defendants, United States, State of Hawaii, and the maintenance of military installations across the territory of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And finally, we enjoin all foreign agents or foreign consulates or diplomats from serving in the territory of the Hawaiian Kingdom until and unless they receive the authority from the Council of Regency that, as the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom. So we are addressing, we are first asking the court that the law requires you to transform yourself into an Article II court. Once that's done, then you can address our claims for relief. And if we can get, once, once we get the court to transform itself and then address our claims for relief, then it accomplishes the goals I think that you're even asking that we do through the State Department. So, so yeah. everything now is I'm, I, might, I might have a little bit of a, oh, I'll let you finish Ken, go ahead. No, so as Dexter was saying, everything is going through the court. So when people would read the amended complaint, they can see what exactly are we asking for because we're basically just forcing, forcing the United States to comply with the law of occupation. That's why we're using this court to enforce, right? But they can't enforce until they transform itself into an Article II court. And that's why this case is so uh, um, critical in that it's forcing the court to address the gorilla. And that's why when... When the motion to, to, to alter or amend, also called a motion for reconsideration, what, it, what we basically are asking is, because the Hawaiian kingdom still exists and that presumption is there, right? It's, it's a legal principle, meaning we exist until you prove we don't. We're asking the court to provide a reasoning as to why they can say the court, the Hawaiian kingdom doesn't exist in their statement, in their orders. They have to qualify that. Right. And that's called a, a, a written statement called findings of facts, conclusions of law. Okay, that's a statement that that covers this particular written statement that they're supposed to put together, which is non-discretionary. They have to explain. So what they have to show is not, oh, the Hawaiian kingdom exists. No, they have to show the Hawaiian kingdom doesn't exist. And here's the evidence. Where's the treaty? No treaty. It still exists. And actually, what, uh, what um, Keanu was saying, um, the court at first, by its initial orders, uh, granting Nervell's motion to dismiss and then denying our motion for judicial notice, is trying to is trying to prevent or is trying to disregard its obligation um, uh, to transform itself into an Article II court by actually manipulating the laws that it cites and saying that it's our obligation to prove that the kingdom does exist. However, in our motion to alter or amend, we correct the court and says, no, your own law says, including State of Hawaii versus Lorenzo, says that we have, until we've actually considered international law, we haven't yet considered international law, and that may change our outlook on the case itself. Um, our, our motion to alter or amend brings that precisely to the court and says, no, it is this international law that you have been disregarding for a long period of time that requires you to change that presumption and to now acknowledge that the presumption is that the Hawaiian kingdom does continue to exist until those defendants, including the U.S., can provide evidence that that continuity has been extinguished. So we are, uh, it's our effort in this motion to alter amend to correct the court and again, place it in a position where uh, even if it, that it has to, how can I say, what's the right word, Ken? Follow its own law and say, you know what? Even our own law says um, that the presumption now is with the Hawaiian Kingdom's existence until you, the United States, or all you other defendants can provide evidence that is that it has been extinguished. And, of course, it's Dr. Sai's opinion and his uh, educated opinion, highly educated opinion, that that that, that doesn't exist. That, that, that rebuttable evidence, so to speak, does not exist. You know, what's so important here is that what Dex is talking about is a shifting of the burden, you know, the burden of proof. So in our uh, uh, motion to amend the order right, and alter the order, amend or alter the order, reconsideration, 
Judge Kobayashi made specific reference to a State of Hawaii court case, State of Hawaii versus French in 1994, right? And in that case, which was cited in a federal case, a Fonoti case, in that case that, that cited State of Hawaii versus French, as Dexter brought up earlier, right? It said that presently there exists no evidence, factual, legal, the Hawaiian Kingdom exists. Presently. Judge Kobayashi left the word presently out and just says there is no factual legal basis for the Hawaiian kingdom to exist, which implies it has already been found. It was a conclusion has been done through evidence, whatever the case may be. But by Judge Kobayashi omitting that word presently, it's a little misleading because then people would think that the federal court already made that decision based upon evidence. When in fact, the court actually said the defendant provided no evidence, therefore, presently, the Hawaiian kingdom doesn't exist. But what that did was it put the burden in State of Hawaii versus Lorenzo, which is what State of Hawaii v. French was referring to. It all goes back to State of Hawaii versus Lorenzo in 1994. That's a precedent case. And what that did was it placed the burden to prove the kingdom exists as a state on the defendant. That's what it did. And that's how that state v. French was making reference, as well as that Fonoti case that cited the state v. French that eventually cited state v. Lorenzo, right? But in that state v. Lorenzo, it stated that the court's rationale, its rationale is subject to question in light of international law. Oh, so what is international law says who has the burden? to prove that a country exists. And that's where you come in with international law says, no, it's not the burden to prove that a country exists if it did exist, that's the presumption. It's the opposing party that has to prove that it doesn't exist. So that's what we were able to correct in this uh, motion for altering or amending the order in presenting this information to the court saying, listen, even the judge, the judges at the Intermediate Court of Appeals admitted that their rationale may be off in light of international law because they were just looking at, at it through state of Hawaii law and American law, not international law. So that, so international law changes or, or, or shifts the burden to prove. And it's not to prove it, it exists, it actually shifts the burden to prove that it doesn't exist. And that is how the presumption idea works. Yeah. I just wanted to kind of capitalize on that with what Dexter was presenting or explaining. Billy, you got a question? Looks like you have a question. Uh, <laughs> so with this information that you just shared about the presumption and the uh, burden of proof, um, how, how does that... I mean, it, it seems like all the evidence is there and it's in the ball is in their court. So, I mean, in the court case, are there moves that are like edging us towards that recognition or that that type of presumption? Because it seems like there's so much evidence today that the U.S. already knows that Hawaii is not, there is no treaty, right? You know, so um, for the regular person just watching it and kind of trying to understand this, I mean, What's kind of the next steps, or what? What do we go from here? What? How does the court case move forward? Or, um, I mean, so, so let me speak to the case itself. So I can't, you know, let me, since I can just focus on the case for now. So presently, the court is now considering our motion to alter our man. Um, and, and I think um, that we've done a pretty good job in, in advising the court um, that a correct reading of the law of the State v. France and State v. Lorenzo um, places the burden on the opposing parties, the defendants, to provide to prove, provide rebuttable evidence that the Hawaiian Kingdom doesn't exist. Okay. And we are, of course, of the opinion that that, that rebuttable evidence doesn't exist itself. But, um, so that is still pending before the court. Now, um, you know, it's, it's, it's possible, and I'll let Ken speak to it more, that uh, that this court may refuse to to take that next step and correct its own error. We may continue to 
Oh, I don't know. I, I don't, let me not speculate too much, but that's always a possibility. We're waiting for the court's decision on the motor, motion to alter amend. There is also another motion that's pending before the court that hasn't yet been decided, and that's the United States motion to dismiss the amended complaint. Right. So once the United States motion to dismiss the amended complaint is ruled upon by the court, then there may be some additional steps that we take, you know, in this case itself. Um, um, I don't want to speculate too far, but, you know, if the orders continue to be denied or the, um, or if the motions to dismiss by the U.S. is granted, then you know we may have to decide or, or deliberate as to whether we appeal this to the uh, to a higher court or not. But but for now we are still waiting for the court's decision on our motion to alter amend and the U.S.'s motion to dismiss the amended complaint. You know, with the with the court case, <clears throat> um, we have people out there listening and and uh, they're saying, okay, so how does this affect me as a uh, uh, Hawaiian, Hawaiian subject. You know, what what benefits do I will I be able to receive, if any, or um, will it affect my everyday life? What you know? How do how do you respond to that? You know, with uh, people that are listening that are saying, okay, I I've heard a lot of the legal aspects of the case. So how, when, where does it affect my daily life? In what way? Let me answer that then. Sure, Keanu, go ahead. Why don't you start and then I'll jump in. So the whole reason why we filed this complaint was because of war crimes being committed upon the population of Hawaii, right? And we're very clear war crimes in the complaint, the amended complaint, as well as the complaint. So we are very, very, very familiar and aware of the fact that uh, people's rights are being violated. And at every step trying to address, addressing those violations, uh, we found ourselves talking to people who were completely ignorant of what their rights really were. So some people claim to have rights under some sovereignty group, which had nothing to do with <laughs> Right. Some people were claiming that uh, they had certain rights to something that really didn't exist because they didn't understand Hawaiian Kingdom law. So this is not this case is not representing people who had the wrong interpretation or position of what Hawaiian law actually is. Right. So people might say, yeah, we're talking all the legality, but the legality is important because it provides the framework <laughs> to resolve this problem. So. The idea of violations of rights, I can speak to it personally, Dexter as well, as well as you call it, you know, so we're not immune from the non-compliance to the law of occupation, but it still doesn't address the fact that you're still not complying and how do we enforce the rights and protect people? Well, the first thing that we needed to do was to address this and take it to some court that can have some enforcement. And here we were faced with the federal court in Hawaii, not properly constituted because they think they're an American court in the United States, but the court itself can enforce the law just as courts in the Hawaiian kingdom would be used to enforce rights. Well, we don't have that, you know? So when people say, well, how do you enforce your rights? Well, we need to find the body that can enforce it. At the permanent court of arbitration, they don't enforce rights. They resolve disputes. And that's what courts normally do. What we're doing with this federal court is utilizing an institution that has been set up here since 1959 as an Article III court. Prior to that, it's been running as an Article IV court since 1900 under the, under the Organic Act, but it's still outside of U.S. territory. What we've managed to do in this case is to present this information within a legal framework that deals with evidence and rules and procedures and not outside of a court where it relies on rhetoric and convincing and trying to get people to believe something. This is just strictly legal and procedural. So if anything, the importance of these proceedings when people are watching it is the Hawaiian Kingdom is able to explain itself 
through these proceedings that it still exists and that the federal court and the United States cannot deny that. Right? Now, what are the consequences, though, once we step into this court and dealing with the procedures? Well, the war crimes that have been committed against people in state courts was called unfair trial. So a court that is not properly constituted and provides a, a determination where somebody will be incarcerated or their, or their property taken, that is a judgment which is called extrajudicial. It is stemming from an entity that is not properly constituted. That is a war crime under Article 147 of the Geneva Convention. That's, that's a great breach. Okay. Now, at the same time, this court is not properly constituted, but we're trying to get the court to become properly constituted. So if it proceeds down a path that we don't want it to go, there are issues of, 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 of war crimes of unfair trial that, that may come into play, may. And that's why Dexter and I, we were very careful not to throw that out. We're not, personally, I'm not here, and officially, we are not here to put this court in a bind. What we're doing here is we are, as officials of the government, providing the ability for the court to transform itself into a properly constituted court to continue, right? Because also all past decisions, just by our case itself, all past decisions made by the U.S. District Court since 1959 are all void because they never had authority in a foreign country. We need to provide and assist them in that transition. So even in the amicus brief that was submitted, when these three legal bodies explain to the court why it should transform itself into an Article II court, it also acknowledged that all the past decisions can be remedied by following the proclamation by the Council of Regency of provisional laws from 2014. So they made specific reference to that. So we are not asking the, 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 the court to jump off the cliff and hope you land well. <laughs> no, we're trying to bring that court to a point where they don't jump off the cliff, they just take the next step. But we have to provide the transition for that, which is really important, the transition to transform itself and then eventually transform the state of Hawaii and the counties and the U.S. military here to be in compliance. So this is a crucial point, and that's why this order, this uh, order that allowed us, these two orders that allowed the Hawaiian Kingdom to respond is really important because we're not being disrespectful to the court. We understand the court is in a predicament, right? And we want to make sure that the court makes an informed decision that has legal ramifications. And that's what's important. So um, for me, I can say from a, from a professional standpoint, I think everything is going fine with the court because um, it's, it's a lot better than state courts. I mean, they, it, it, they're actually allowing the pleadings to go back and forth. And Dexter is communicating with the Department of Justice, who's representing the United States, not the U.S. Attorney in Honolulu, but the Department of Justice, as well as the Deputy Attorney General and other attorneys. So it, we have to present ourselves not only dignified, but professional, because we know that what we are compelling the court to do from a legal standpoint has profound ramifications, and that nobody wants to be left you know, holding the bag. It has to be understood, and there are procedures. And that's why it's very complicated. But these rules of presumption, these rules of being an Article II court versus an Article II versus an Article III court, uh, what is a government, what is a state, uh, what is international law, all these come into play. And that's what you're seeing being played out in these proceedings. Um, in fact, I've been in uh, communication with a very well-known law professor from Great Britain. And when he, uh, when it was brought to his attention, this federal lawsuit, and this is a very well-known scholar. He, he wrote it in an email to me, he says, this case is fascinating. See, they're intrigued because it, 
has all the aspects of international law, facts, intrigue, 100 years of violations, what do you do? How do you deal with enforcement when there's nobody here to enforce? Using a federal court in a country that still exists. Yeah, it. somebody should make a movie on this. But nevertheless, we still have to address this because people's rights are being violated. And this is where we can control the situation. Now, mind you, it's not putting our eggs in this basket. Oh, no, there's so many other things that are taking place here, right? And that's what's important. But it is a basis for us to lay bare evidence, rules of evidence, why the Hawaiian Kino continues to exist until you show it doesn't. That's the key. So if anybody should get anything out of this federal lawsuit, anybody, not just Hawaiian subjects watching it, this is about a country that still exists. It's not about trying to get people to recognize the country. No, it's asking people to provide evidence that it doesn't exist. And that shift of that burden is important because it has a lot in play with, with, with the mindset. Because remember, we're always in the past thinking, we got to prove it, we got to prove it. Now we're saying, no, you don't have to prove it. you got to disprove it. And it's a real principle. So, so Kali, um, maybe I'll answer your question. I mean, everything Keanu says, I agree with, and but maybe I'll answer your question this way. Uh, if you're looking at the complaint itself, uh, I mean, I think we've made um, a very compelling, if not undisputed uh, position that, of course, the court is obligated to transfer, transform itself into an Article II court. Okay? So I think this case has made that undisputed, compelling argument that the court has that obligation to do so. So to answer your question, if the court, in fact, does do so, I mean, you can already start to answer some of the questions. How does that affect you? I mean, if the court is now transformed, transformed itself into an Article II court, is now administering Hawaiian Kingdom law. Okay, is no longer administering U.S. or state of Hawaii law. Then the court, it's it's easy to next follow, and the court can then look at and grant our relief uh, for injunctive and declaratory relief. And then it requires, it can, one of the things I forgot to mention is that the parties may not know, but uh, defaults have been entered against the state of Hawaii. Uh, Governor David Ige, um, the, um, I'm sorry, and, and Tain O'Hara and what was the other person? Department of uh, Securities and Exchange for Hawaii. And uh, so defaults have been entered against the state of Hawaii for their failure to answer the amended complaint. So essentially, because defaults have been ent uh, entered against them, essentially the, the claims for relief has also been, at this point, um, entered against them for their failure to answer. If the court transforms itself into an Article II court as it should, then it has those additional um, consequences. And I think it starts, it leads us to that path. See, our intent here, of course, is the end of the prolonged illegal occupation, okay? And one of those things to start with is the administration of Hawaiian Kingdom law, not US law. I think this court, this case, once the Article II court, the court transforms itself into an Article II court, we're on, it, we're on our way to that. That impacts all of the citizens here in Hawaii. If, the, if Hawaiian Kingdom law is administered and not U.S. or state of Hawaii law. So we're starting down that path. Um, and, and again, it's only specific to this case. As, as Dr. Sai said, or as Keanu said, you know, this case um, goes beyond just the, the pleadings that's filed. I think it has implications. And one of those implications, of course, is Dr. Keanu's recent um, presentation before the U.N. national security, right? Those things don't happen without... Dr. Sai, without the participation of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, the National Lawyers Guild, the American Association of Jurists, um, and that representation before the UN Security Council, including um, the documents that were provided by Dr. Sai and the uh, IADL, NLG, and the AAJ. So there are things that are happening beyond the case itself. But I think just to answer the question for me, once Article Two transformation begins or is completed, then I think that changes the entire paradigm of what we're looking at. It shifts everything here. So, you know, if I can add the benefit. So, just a quick, uh, slight correction. So, it wasn't the National Security Council, United Nations Security Council, but the United right. Nations Human Rights Council. Oh. Yeah, Human Rights Council. Oh, yes. Thank you for correction. And what was presented or delivered to the Human Rights Council 
was the war crimes committed against Hawaii's people. So the record is set with regard to war crimes, right? Now, what can a Hawaiian subject benefit from, or just say people in Hawaii, when Hawaiian kingdom law begins to be administered, okay? For number one, no IRS taxes. You don't pay IRS taxes. That's an American tax. That that you can only tax in America, and they, that country can only tax their citizens abroad, right? Like their multinational corporations and their citizenry. So right off the bat, you're gonna not pay so much taxes. What you will pay is taxes to the state of Hawaii, which would be Hawaiian Kingdom taxes as part of the transition. Okay. Another thing that you would benefit from uh, if you were Native or Aboriginal Hawaiian, uh, free healthcare at Queen's Hospital. That's actually a statute in the Hawaiian Kingdom law that healthcare is at no cost. So you don't have to worry about medical coverage. Okay. Another thing that Aboriginal Hawaiians or Native Hawaiians have under Hawaiian law, you can you can get up to a fifty you can get up to fifty acres from the Hawaiian government in fee simple. At fifty cents an acre back in the kingdom, that was the law of eighteen fifty. Well, I use an inflation calculator that's I think seventeen dollars, right? So seventeen dollars an acre. That's Hawaiian kingdom law. So what you basically have is low overhead which means you have more money in your pocket to spend. And when you spend, you contribute to the political economy. And that's how the Hawaiian kingdom is supposed to operate. Right now, we're under the American political economy and the cost of living is very high, right? Nobody has a home. People are now saying, I can't get a home. They, they run a million dollars now in Honolulu. Well, how's that? $17 an acre. For Aboriginal Hawaiians, it's all there. It's statutory. So people need to understand that under Hawaiian kingdom law, there's so much there that can be beneficial. So it's not the Hawaiian kingdom exists. No, the Hawaiian kingdom and its laws exist, and I have no access to those laws. And that was the basis of my, my oral delivery of a statement to the United Nations Human Rights Council. If you go back and actually read, uh, what was said, which, by the way, we also incorporated into our motion for reconsideration. We have that in there. Right? So there's a lot here on the federal court. And for it to last this long, 11 months, that means it's starting to take hold, this information. And the judge was not quick to pull that trigger in her two orders that this is a political question. She made no reference to a political question because we established this isn't a political question. But yet when she said the Hawaiian kingdom doesn't exist, then she could be implying that we're a new country trying to get recognition. Okay, that's a political question, but she didn't use political question. For whatever reason, we know what a political question is and why it doesn't apply, but she did open the door for Dexter in representing the country to respond appropriately and put the burden on her to prove the kingdom doesn't exist, not to prove the kingdom exists, prove it doesn't exist. Until that happens, the presumption is in favor of the Hawaiian kingdom. That's how it works. And, and see, and that's why when, it, when, when this case went to the, per, when, when the case went to the permanent court of arbitration in the Netherlands back in 1999, the permanent court of arbitration in order to accept the Hawaiian kingdom as an independent state under its institutional jurisdiction so that it could form the arbitrational tribunal later in June of 2000 to resolve the dispute. From 1999, November, until June, the court had to determine whether or not the Hawaiian kingdom exists. Now that presumption of continuity applied back then as well. So what the Permanent Court of Arbitration had to do was to find evidence that it doesn't exist, not to find evidence that it does exist. All they needed to show or to see was the treaty that Hawaii, the Hawaiian kingdom had with the Netherlands, right? And that's where the court is at. They couldn't find any evidence that the Hawaiian kingdom doesn't exist. And that is what is called a juridical act stemming from a juridical fact of the Hawaiian kingdom's continued existence. So we have 
all the evidence that the Hawaiian kingdom continues to exist, but a lot of our people, because they still think in that other way, they think that it has to be recognized. No, no. It has to be shown that it doesn't exist, not that we got to show that it has to be recognized. It's like looking at the cup. Is it half full or is it half empty, right? If it's half full, right, then get more water. If it's half empty, everybody tries to defend it, right? So these are two different ways of looking at things. What we're saying here is a presumption of continuity is like the cup is half full. It's not half empty. You don't have to defend it. <laughs> the burden is to show this is not our cup and it's not our water. Until then, it is our cup. It is, it is our water. So that, that, that cliche that, that people may have heard, if you're a country, act like it, right? And not walk around and say, am I a country? Can you please recognize me? Am I a country? Do you think I'm a country? I don't know if I'm a country. No, no. Flip it. We are a country. We are who we were. That's why we are who we are today. But we are who we were. And that is what's important. So a lot of what we're going to do is a mindset. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a different way of thinking. Way of thinking. And that's why I think this is a good opportunity. That's why I think this is a good opportunity. To share. Yeah. To share. Yeah. If I just might add one more thing. Um, in our request for judicial notice, we wanted the court to understand that pretty much the rest of the world um, sees it the way we see it, which is the presumption of the continuity of the Hawaiian kingdom. And the fact that the, the permanent court of arbitration made that determination and that most of the rest of the world and down the administrative council looks at it from the way that Keanu explained that it was a juridical fact that required the consequences of the juridical act. So we were asking the court, and in this case, to understand the rest of the world sees it the way that we're making the argument or the way that we're presenting it. Um, when the court, of course, denied initially the motion for judicial notice and incorrectly, in our opinion, um, cited the law stating that it was our obligation that we provided no evidence the state existed. That's why the motion to alter or amend correctly um, um, then corrects the court and says, I'm sorry, Your Honor, that presumption now is on the defendants to prove that we don't exist. And the rest of the world, if you ask the rest of the world by, based on how they view things, that they should view it the same way that we view it, and the United States is obligated. And until such time that they provide that evidence to show that that continuity has been extinguished, the court has no, no other alternative, no other option, but um, to rule in our favor, if I may say so. You know, and that's why it's important. You know, that's why it's important. What the, uh, uh, what the judge has to do is it has to provide the evidence that the Hawaiian kingdom doesn't exist. But where do you get that evidence? From the State Department. You have to get a treaty. You have to find something that the State Department or the executive branch had done. But you're also facing the fact that the State Department also had its embassy in the Netherlands who negotiated and entered into an agreement with the Council of Regency during the, uh, at the time at the Permanent Court of Arbitration for them to access all the records. So the judge has all the evidence that the executive already did that, show that they didn't do that. And that's why the burden is on the judge to provide that type of evidence, which is really important. In light of the fact that there is no evidence, then the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists. It's not like we keep going around going, but we exist. Come on, please recognize me. Recognize me, please, please. No, no, no. You sure we don't exist? Sure we don't exist. Yeah, exactly. I, no. Yeah, I might, I might just say it's not the burden. Of, it's not the judge's to burden to provide the evidence, that rebuttable evidence. But it's the judge's obligation to declare that it's the that it's the burden of the United States and these other de defendants to provide that rebuttable evidence. And until they do, until they do, the court's obligated to to understand that the, the continuity of the Hawaiian kingdom, that presumption uh, is there, so. Now what the United States, actually, the United did, States actually did in the filing, in the filing, they said that, uh, they said that, uh, uh, they have a way, they have a way, because, 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 like resolution of annexation. Resolution of annexation. Is this echoing? Is this echoing? Can you guys do that? Is that me? Is that me? 
Okay. Okay. Well, well, what's the next time, time we hear? What is that? Dexter, time mute yours. Dexter, time mute yours. Can I go? Oh. Okay. Okay. Feedback from Dex. <laughs> okay. So, in our complaint, okay, in the amended complaint as well as the original complaint, we identified the most the most serious of the war crimes which has led to the multiple war crimes that stem from that serious war crime and that serious war crime is called usurpation of sovereignty so to usurp is to impose upon something right so usurp is not lawful so usurpation of sovereignty is the imposition of american law within occupied territory that's what usurpation of sovereignty is. And we explained that when America passed the joint resolution of annexation, they applied that in internal law that allowed all the rest of the laws to be applied here, including the Statehood Act of 1959 and everything else. So that's evidence of, of, a, of a war crime, which is stated in the complaint. What is interesting is that the United States, in its pleading with regard to responding to um, uh, Dexter's filing of uh, a response to the United States motion to dismiss. The United States actually admitted that they have sovereignty over Hawaii by virtue of annexation in 1898 and the Statehood Act of 1959. From a legal standpoint, they just admitted to the war crime of usurpation of sovereignty, which was in the complaint. They did not refute that it's not a war crime. They admitted that they have Hawaii by a war crime. Now, Judge Kobayashi legally cannot use the statement made by the United States as evidence that they extinguished the Hawaiian kingdom because the statement made is a crime itself. They're supposed to show a treaty, not admit to a joint resolution and the statehood act, which Professor William Shabas says is unlawful imposition of American law called usurpation of sovereignty. So you know how they say, be careful what you say because it could be used against you? That's already on the record. And we made that point in the motion to reconsider because the judge needs to look at evidence, not the United States admitting to the war crime of usurpation of sovereignty as to how they got sovereignty in Hawaii. When does, when does, uh, decision come down uh, we don't have a timetable they, they didn't give a, a deadline at this point so we filed um, the a motion to alter or amend it was filed on April 11th so we are now what one week a little over one week out so and, and the court didn't give a scheduling order to say when it would issue its order to uh, on the motion to alter or amend so and I haven't actually had any um, administrative orders indicating that it would allow other parties to provide responses or oppositions. So that's a possibility as well. It 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 could make an uh, you know an electronic order or an advisory order informing the parties that being the United States essentially that they have an opportunity to respond. And then usually, if that's the case, if they give the United States an opportunity to respond, they normally will let the Hawaiian Kingdom then file a reply to that response. But um, that kind of advisory order hasn't come out yet. So it's possible the court could rule without any further responses or could issue that, like I said, that advisory order. So what So what, 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 what would you ask, what would you uh, ask uh, Hawaiian Kingdom subjects, Hawaiian kingdom subjects uh, to do, uh, as, to far do as, as far as should they, should they uh, write their who can they write or what what should people do in the time being? Well, well, you want to say this? Okay, well, get informed and learn how the Hawaiian Kingdom operates and learn the laws, learn its history, right? Because that's so important that what we're dealing with here is changing what is called a national consciousness, right? And And we can't think that we're thinking Hawaiian as a Hawaiian subject and we keep 
saying I'm a Hawaiian subject when we don't even understand what a Hawaiian subject is, right? So in classes that I teach at the university, in my graduate course of, of, of school teachers that are taking this graduate course, they're beginning to realize that national consciousness is, is really elusive. It's hard to grab because we all operate on what we've been led to believe. And it, we have to start to inform ourselves how the country operated, right? How it's a constitutional system. So that's, that's really the foundation for it. But as far as people knowing what their rights are, well, if you go to the blog, uh, dealing with letters that people can read because it's tied directly to the federal lawsuit, you know, they could go ahead and send letters by downloading them to the IRS and to the state of Hawaii regarding taxes because the collection of taxes, which is identified in our complaint, also constitutes a war crime because it stems from usurpation of sovereignty, unlawful position. Now, people in Hawaii, not just Hawaiian subjects, any alien, they're supposed to pay taxes, but under Hawaiian kingdom law, not under American law. So there's these letters that people can um, submit to the IRS and just provide notification that, that hey, I've been made aware that my rights have been violated. I didn't know that. So that's a that's a start, right? But again, learn. You know, I would recommend go to uh, HawaiianKingdom.org and go to the bottom button, and it says Royal Commission of Inquiry. Once you go there, download the book, the ebook, Royal Commission of Inquiry, investigating war crimes and human rights violations, because that is a lot of information there, and I think people should have that, and just kind of read through it, right, when you get a chance. But also, I would say follow the blog. Yeah, um, information that would be brought up will be timely. There's a lot of things that Dexter and I deal with that um, that are very sensitive, and we have to make sure that it's it, it's done correctly, especially through legal means. But once it's been sanitized, <laughs> then you'll find it on the blog. Then it's up, right? But until then. Uh, uh, that's I've been involved, I've been involved with. We've been doing this for quite a while. And the one thing that we've learned is, is patience and to do it right, right? But education at every stage. And that's why, Kili, I'm glad you're on, on here because as a Kumu at Kumeme Schools, it's those generation of young men and women that are the future of the country. And they should not be taught all the baggage that we are trying to deal with today in our people's minds, right? They need to have a clear mind. They need to understand what is that national consciousness and, and move to, to, to contribute to the country, right? And not contribute to the confusion. So, wait, Dex, you're going to say something? Um, one, one of the things I was going to say is that, um, to address Kali's question, is that recently um, um, a client through a different attorney, Francis Alkane, um, enlisted Keanu Sai, a uh, Dr. Sai, and filed a motion to dismiss. And of course, pursuant to Lorenzo, provided that evidence to that evidence that's required. Um, one of the things I might say is that if you have other attorneys, or you, if you're, let's say, let me just limit it to perhaps criminal cases for now. If you are represented by a public defender, or you're represented by a criminal attorney, and you agree with the position we've taken then have that attorney recommend that that attorney make this argument as well and make the, the argument that the motions to this should be dismissed or the complaints should be dismissed for lack of subject matter jurisdiction and enlist the, the services of Dr. Sai as the expert to, so that we have more of these cases made in, in the court proceedings. Um, Cause I think these kinds of cases can only continue to bring knowledge to the courts as well as the defendants. Um, since um, Dr. Sai brought it up, I just have to issue a word of caution as far as those letters to the IRS or the State of Hawaii Tax Department. Um, just a word of caution. If you are going to do it as a, as a matter of a notice of protest and then perhaps continue to pay under protest, that's one thing. Um, but, but if you are considering perhaps not paying entirely those taxes, you, I would recommend you consult first a tax attorney. Um, and find out what the consequences may be for withholding the payment of taxes. Because while you may be correct legally, 
as we know, there still may be consequences to not paying those taxes. So um, I might first recommend that, you know, if you decide that something you want to do as a, a citizen of the Hawaiian nation is to make that letter of protest or notice of protest and payment under protest, that's one thing. But if you want to consider withholding payment of taxes, that you really should first consult a tax attorney to find out what those consequences are. Is there a Hawaiian, there there a Hawaiian tax, attorney? tax attorney? I, I, I'm not one, and I'm not sure there are. So, and and again, what you what you would be doing if you decide not to pay is you're not paying federal taxes, and you're not paying uh, state of Hawaii taxes. So you might have to understand what the consequences are of not paying those taxes. So it would probably be, what would be the federal law for not paying? What would be the state of Hawaii law for not paying? So, so, and it might involve uh, consulting criminal defense attorneys as well. So I'm just saying something to be aware of and that issue that note of caution. So let's, let's I wanna clarify that too as well. So the, the letter, the purpose of the letter <clears throat> is it's a war crime, okay? So the collection of taxes by virtue of an American law is really what's part of the federal lawsuit. So it's, so it's, it's there. So everything in the letter is stemming from the federal lawsuit as far as its pleadings. But it's not making any recommendation on what you should or should not do. Because the one thing about providing uh, information to an alleged person committing a war crime is they need to be made aware, right? And that's what the letter is. It's providing awareness that you are committing a war crime. Now, what you do beyond that, well, that's a personal decision on what could be considered survivability, not being harassed, but it's starting a paper trail. And, and that letter is basically an, a piece of evidence of, I'm aware. <laughs> I'm aware of something that I wasn't aware of before. So if, it, if there's anything that can be taken out of this, this uh, uh, federal lawsuit is that it is informing people of information that they were not aware of. Because it's not just the war crime of usurpation of sovereignty. In our complaint, we also address the war crime of denationalization, right? We also address the war crime of destruction of property. So when you talk about a war crime, that is considered the highest level of international law. It's called a use cogens, right, or peremptory norm. You cannot deviate. That is like the highest of highest of, of what you're not supposed to do. Well, there needs to come to a time where people say, you know what, I didn't know, now I know, but I'm now going to hold you accountable because now I know you know. And it's really that awareness for people to make informed decisions. And should the collection still take place after the awareness? then that becomes the problem upon that person or entity that was made aware, right? And that's the intent of that letter or those letters. It's to bring the awareness that this is a war crime. So if you notice at the end, it says, this is a letter that will serve as notice that you've been made aware. <laughs> that's what's important. Um, some people might have said, oh, well, you also have to... Uh, uh, decommit or... or, or do away with your U.S. citizenship and or something like that. No, that has nothing to do with anything. This is just a legal instrument for protection in the future. Just setting the record. Can this letter be sent to um, workplaces that are taking federal taxes out of our paychecks as a way to inform them? Or is that well, not? Well, the, well, I think what is important, Kili, is the information that is in the letter and that you can share with anybody, <laughs> whether it's employer, employer, whether it's uh, friends, whether it's the individuals responsible for the collection, it's really information because if, if anything in that letter, it directs them to the federal lawsuit. That's what it does. <laughs> it draws everything to the federal lawsuit and that's where it brings in the severity of the situation. But yeah, I would recommend uh, share it one and all. <laughs> Just get the word out. Yeah, it, it, it's specific on the issue of the war crime of usurpation of sovereignty, and it's it's self-explanatory. And then they could get more information um, in the federal court. In the federal court, the pleadings. Okay. Well, I, 
I think we've, uh, you know, we, we need to have a uh, second episode on this because there's still a lot of uh, information that we can share with others. And uh, we're almost at the two hour limit. So uh, any final thoughts on this, Dexter? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm muting myself. So uh, I, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with Ken as far as sharing the information, share it all over. You know, I mean, provide notice wherever you think it's available. I mean, where you think it should be provided. Just as a, another word of cautious no, caution, though, you just have to think about when you do provide it, if you decide to provide it, who you're providing, to, who you're providing it to, and if there might be consequences as a result of providing that notice. Now, that being said, I, I wholeheartedly agree that we need to provide as much notice and awareness as we can. Well, well. Keanu, Keanu, final thoughts? You're muted. Sorry. So I'm all for this opportunity for myself and Dexter just to share with what's going on in the federal lawsuit because it is complicated, you know, no doubt. I, I don't underestimate the, the complexity of the situation. But our job is to break it down, to make it user-friendly. But it is an exciting time for our country because people are listening and, and and that is what's good right and this information is still being taught i teach it at the university Ili teach it at Kamehameha, and others are teaching it as well so that change not is coming that change has already taken place it's ongoing right um but uh i initially told Kali that i was going to be off at 8 30 and <laughs> Just realized that my wife just pulled this a perfect timing. <laughs> so, but yeah, thank you, Kali and uh, and Kili and uh, and Dexter. Good seeing you. <laughs> well, mahalo. Ma mahalo to to both of you, Dexter, Keanu, and uh, we got to do this again because there's more to talk about. Okay, mahalo. Well, aloha, uh, aloha, uh, aloha. Uh, Kili, any final thoughts on your part? Um, I think final thoughts for me is that there is a lot to do and that we need to just focus on what we can do, um, get educated and continue. I, I'm really interested in the letter and kind of like sharing that with people um, just as a way to keep track and to bring men's race or, um, you know, acknowledge that they, that, hey, it's real. And I like the whole perspective of we're no longer having to prove that we are free. We just, we are, <laughs> yeah, we are a country. We don't have to like prove that um, and shifting that burden. But I still think that um, more education needs to happen, uh, bringing more people together, and especially people um, who love this place and love this land. It doesn't matter if they're Hawaiian nationals or they're resident aliens. Um, I think it's a time where we can pull together and actually fight a huge injustice for 130 years of occupation and try to figure out how to finish that. And I talk about in class, like the, the way to, for non-Hawaiian nationals to become Hawaiian nationals is to end occupation so they can naturalize and become Hawaiian nationals, you know? And then the way for Hawaiian nationals to stand up as Hawaiian nationals is to end occupation, you know, so we can vote. So it seems like both paths have the same mission um, and the same steps need to be done on both ways. So it was exciting. I think that the letter is a great start. And I think that, um, more work needs to be done and needs to be shared on on this. Um, geez, there's so much. There's so much information at one time. I'm not sure how. <laughs> I think we needed ten more shows yeah. to go through that. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, so more to come. Well, you know, for those of you who are out there watching, you know, what breaks to my mind is what has taken place in the Ukraine, and when the Russians were, you know, ready to invade with their entire army and heavy equipment and so forth. And President Zelensky stood up and said, "We, I am not leaving. And as a result of that, uh, the Ukrainian people rose up to the occasion and uh, said, we're not leaving either. And the patriotism and the rise of the, uh, the pride, not only pride, but also the necessity for them to protect their land and protect their rights, as well as um, you know their their freedom. You know was became very very evident, and they were willing 
to risk whatever it took, including their life, in order to protect what they had. And granted, we're not there yet as Hawaiian Kingdom subjects, as Hawaiians and uh, protected persons here in Hawaii. But we need to get to that point so that even though there may be risks that uh, that we have to we have to take, that we would take that risk in order for us to be able to get our country and uh, the government back in power. That's to add, that's, to, add, to, add to that too. Um, I, I'm glad you brought that up. But even on the Russian side, there are many Russians who are supporting the Ukrainians. Yes. You know, so it's the same yeah. situation for us too. There are many Americans who support foreign nationals. So, <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we're at a time and place where we, I mean, the Mauna had 20 plus flags of different countries. And so we have the support. And like was mentioned in, the, in tonight's show, um, the world knows and sees the truth. So it's time for us, our own people here in Hawaii, to rise up together. Not a racial people, not Hawaiian blood or any of that kind of stuff, but as people who love this place and love this land and love this people, man, it's time for us to all stand up and ride together. Just like the, um, you know, we can see that the Ukrainians are doing and how people around the world are standing for Ukraine. The stand for us right. too, if we let them right. know and educate them on what happened. You know, right. so yeah, great parallel there, Kali. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, again, uh, this isn't to to diminish Dexter's warning about the retaliation that's going to come come about, but. You know, if we're going to get our country, if we're going to get our land and our government back, back in power, we're going to have to start taking risks. And yes, sending the letters uh, to the IRS, sending the, the letter to the tax office for the state of Hawaii. If we can get everybody to send those letters in and let them deal with it from that point on. And... Uh, uh, I'm all for it. One point eight people in Hawaii. Uh, let's start out with fifty grand, fifty k, <laughs> fifty thousand people turning those letters. So yeah, yeah let's do it. You yeah. know, um, just flood their flood their if, offices. If you're if if you're wondering where you can get that letter, um, go to HawaiianKingdom.org/blog, and it's the uh, the blog post that was posted today. Doctor Sai posted it this morning and. You can get uh, the two letters that were drafted, generically, of course, and open that those letters up. Just put your names in there, print it up, and send it into the IRS and the uh, Hawaii State Taxation Department. And let's flood those agencies with our letters because they're going to start to wonder how are they going to deal with this stuff. Anything else, Kelly? Nope, just stay tuned. If you have questions, keep tuning in. Uh, let us know. You can hit me down on Instagram, Kanaka Mentality. Let's talk story. Let's make some, send some letters. This is another episode of Kanaka Express. And again, mahalo for, for joining us tonight. And no apologies for going over one hour uh, because there was just too much information to be shared tonight. And I hope you guys join us next week because... We have uh, uh, Donovan Preza with his uh, master's degree in geography, and we're going to be talking about land issues in the Hawaiian Kingdom next next Tuesday, seven o'clock. Share uh, our flyer when it comes out with everybody that you know, because the more people that we get, the the more in information we're going to be able to get out and the more people that will be able to join us. Until then, mahalo nui loa and ahui ho. Mahalo lin, good job. Aloha. Oh no.